Welcome, um, audience. Um, from Utrecht, from the Netherlands, maybe from abroad. Some of you are watching this opening event from online. We're very happy to also have you. And of course, I'm very happy to have you here in the theater hall of Het Huis Utrecht. My name is Arjon Dunnewind. I'm the director of Impact. Um, the curse of smooth operations. What is this? Curse of smooth operations. What is smooth and why is it a curse? I like operations to go smooth. Probably most of you like that. Um, but what do we lose when we are totally focused on things going smooth? And who is trying to sell us this idea of smoothness? These are just a few of the questions that our curators the artists and the speakers of the Impact Festival 2022 will share with you tonight and in the upcoming four days here in Utrecht um, at Impact Center for Cultural uh, Center for Media Culture, and I hope you've all seen the opening of the festival exhibition earlier today, um, or the second part of the exhibition at the Steenweg, Steenweg 26. Um, but most of the events of the festival, the screenings, the lectures, the panels, the performances will take here in the house, will take place here in the house Utrecht. Um, I'm not going to tell much more about the festival themes, because um, who else could do that better than the curators of the Impact Festival 2022? Please a warm applause for Eric Bunger and Florian Wüst. Thank you, Ion. And my name is Erik Bünger, and this is my co-curator, Florian Wüst. At the center of the Impact Festival 2022 stands a proposition. The most dissatisfying technology of all is the one that works. We all know the feeling of dissatisfaction when technology doesn't work, when it um, when it underperforms, when it causes unforeseen side effects, and when it breaks down. We want to turn things around and look at it from the opposite perspective. What if the most dissatisfying technology of all is the one that does its job well, or even exceeds expectations? This seems contradictory. All technology is there to achieve some kind of task, to, to satisfy a certain desire. Once this desire is satisfied, how can this be dissatisfying? How can satisfaction be dissatisfying? To think about this, we would like to give you a few examples. Let's start with one of the most basic uh, technological tools of all, of all, a hammer. A technological tool such as the hammer is never there for its own sake. It's always there to achieve some kind of goal in the future. You use a hammer to build a house. You need to build a house to have a place to sleep in. You need to have a place to sleep in or in order to go to work next day, and on and on and on and on. So when a technological tool such as the hammer truly works, it does not give you full satisfaction. It puts you on a path where satisfaction is always postponed towards the future. Or to put it differently, it puts you on a path of constant dissatisfaction. Or take visual technologies. Visual technologies have always been driven by the desire to create a true representation of the world. But what happens when this drive is finally satisfied? When a perfect simulation is finally achieved? Isn't the world where you can no longer tell reality from forgery a part deeply dissatisfying. This is indeed the world we live in today, a world full of algorithmically enhanced deep fakes, in which it is increasingly difficult to distinguish from propaganda and news, from 
facial recognition to racial profiling. Or another example would be social media. The promise of social media was that it would bring us into greater connection with each other. The, the technology was supposed to help, us, uh, help you find friends or, or, uh, that with similar interests or expose you to content that would be relevant to you. But uh, this drive for connection has simultaneously led to absolute disconnection. Today we are locked into filter bubbles where we are served the same content over and over and we are completely separate from, separated from those who do not share our views. The idea that technology can provide ultimate satisfaction and at the same time be ultimately dissatisfying is baffling and paradoxical. In order to shed light on the contradictions of contemporary culture, we think art is the right thing to look at and to deploy. Art is capable of criticizing culture while simultaneously showing itself to be part of the cultural framework it criticizes. Therefore, we put art with its counterintuition, with its sincerity, with its sense of humor at the center in this year's festival program comprising two exhibitions, screenings, talks, keynotes and performances. I don't say that impact hasn't done that time and again. Media art constituting the core of the festival. But, for instance, each panel discussion of the curse of smooth operations departs from a concrete artwork in the exhibition or screening program. The most um, common way to look upon technology is from a humanist perspective, where you see uh, technology as a tool that we humans control. We want to look upon it from the opposite perspective. Technology here becomes a force that controls us, rather than the other way around. A hammer here is a good example. It may seem as if I am in control of the hammer when I'm using it, but if the hammer puts me on a path where my satisfaction is constantly postponed towards the future, then the hammer is truly in control of me. This is why we call it the curse of smooth operations. Uh, technology here becomes a curse in the sense that it's a force that works upon us, and also in the sense that it's a force we cannot get out of. Because if language is a technology, we use technology every time we open our mouths to speak. By considering technology in the broadest sense of the word, knowledge, put into practical use, we move away from a discourse around technology confined to electronic devices and digital applications. The festival combines excursions into the history and future of natural science, industrial capitalism, computational and urban infrastructures, social polarization and biopolitics. In order to critically address a temp contemporary life world, whose every aspect has been radically transformed and optimized by technology. One essential thing for us when we created this, uh, the, uh, the program for this festival was that we wanted, we wanted to break with the fetishization, fetish, fetishization of error that is so common in media art. If artists have, media artists have traditionally tried to uh, break or fight the system, by, um, th they have often done so by trying to um, expose or, or utilize the tiny cracks in this system. We want, do not want to deal with the beauty of error, but the horror of things working perfectly well. We do not want to focus on the subversive potential of tiny bugs, but on the oppressiveness of a system that doesn't fail and is able to perpetuate itself endlessly. We would like to thank artist Manuel Saez, who was involved in the early stages of conceiving the curse of smooth operations. Our greatest thanks goes to the team of impact, to Ion, Fraukje, to Daniela, to Michel, Jeroen, Bram, and all the others, as well as the entire festival team, including the team of Het Haus Utrecht, for their enthusiasm and hard work, making the upcoming days a great 
and lasting experience, we are very sure. And of course, we want to thank all the artists, filmmakers, and speakers that contribute to the program of IMPACT 2022. This brief introduction is followed by three responses to the proposition that lies at the heart of the festival. First, a short online lecture entitled Useless Capitalism by Todd McGovern from the philosophy podcast Why Theory, which he runs together with Ryan Eagley, Engley every two weeks since 2017. On Saturday evening, Todd and Ryan will be back on the screen here to deliver a new Why Theory episode specially produced for the Curse of Smooth Operations. Secondly, writer and musician Per Turn presents a performative reading of his poem, We are like in a boat with water up to the gunwales and there are waves breaking over the sides the whole time which he stitched together from a web forum used by Swedish CEOs to discuss the task of being a leader. And thirdly, with the shredded hologram rose, or how broken media can resolve new insights, artist and researcher Rosa Menkman peeks into the metadata structure of holograms, and by this, into a future made up of machine learning and super resolutions. Please enjoy the opening of IMPACT 2022. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that introduction and for that great uh, commencement to the, to the festival. And I just hope that uh, my talk doesn't, I actually hope that it violates the, the, the edict of the festival and, and runs smoothly technologically. So I'd like to begin with just a, a little story about an investment banker that will, I think, encapsulate everything I want to I wanna say so that if you get a little bored, you can tune out after this. So a banker drives up to his office in New York City and he opens the door of his brand new BMW. And then at that exact moment, a taxi speeds by and knocks off the door of his, of his car. And the, the banker's irate, immediately calls the police to report the incident. Police come, the banker demands they do everything they can to apprehend the, the driver who, who, who had the temerity to damage his pristine car. And the police look really perplexed at him and they don't, he's ranting and they don't, they don't ask him what's wrong. And when they, they don't ask him the details about the incident, uh, the, the, the banker gets even more and more upset. And he says, I don't think you really appreciate the gravity of my, of my loss. And finally, one of the officers looks, uh, tells the banker, he's like, look, I think you got a lot bigger problems than missing a car door. And he points down to the banker's missing left arm, which was also detached in the accident. And the banker looks down horrified and exclaims, oh my God, I lost my Rolex too. And so, okay, the point of this joke is that for the banker and for the capitalists, bodily integrity, that's, that which is useful, means less to him than the commodities he's invested in. So capitalism's great innovation, I think, involves how it runs counter to utility, to usefulness. And this innovation consists in how it turns our attention to what exceeds the good and the useful. So capitalist, capitalism produces value by producing more than what people need to reproduce themselves. I think that's the crucial dimension of it. And I think it really fits into this idea that technology is, is made not to necessarily work well, but to not work in a certain way. So if I need three shirts to clothe myself adequately, capitalist society tells me I have to have 30. If I need 2,000 calories to sustain myself, capitalist society tells me I need 3,000. And then I need to buy an elliptical machine to work off those excessively uh, gained calories. So if I need a one bedroom apartment to add for adequate shelter, it persuades me I need actually a 10 bedroom mansion. So the less I need, the more it tells me I should desire. And I think this works regardless of one's class status within capital. So the only, it's, it's only through the production and consumption of a useless excess. And I think that idea is really important, the uselessness of it, that the useless excess that goes beyond what I can productively make use of 
And it's only in this way that capitalist society can sustain itself. This is what Marx calls surplus labor time. Surplus labor time produces excessive commodities that keep the capitalist in business. So capitalism thrives by producing more than what's good for it or good for the people living within it, which is why obesity is a, something that could only be a widespread problem in the capitalist epoch. You might even say that capitalism is the obese form of society. It doesn't focus on what's good for us, but what's excessive and thus what is a source of enjoyment. So if capitalism isn't convincing us to consume more and more than we can use, it's dying. So capitalism's commitment to a useless excess implies a fundamental disdain for the good. Nothing's ever good enough. Capitalists always wants more than what would suffice. More money, more commodities, more enjoyment. So this is why I think it applies to those who are producing just as much as to those who are consuming. So to insist on more at all times is to abandon the good, which I think marks capitalism's revolutionary breakthrough relative to other earlier forms of society. This turn away from the good occurs in a turn to the sublime. The sublime object of capitalism privileges no longer contributes to our good. It can be, say, an Armani suit, designer coat, diamond earrings, nice tennis racket. But whatever the sublime object is, it has to transcend the good. It can't just be good for us. The sublime object has to be an excessive object. Because it finds value only in what transcends utility, capitalism has to turn the ordinary object always into a sublime object, always trying to insert this sublimity into the object and thus bring it out of the realm of just the purely useful or the good. So it's only as a sublime commodity that an object can have any value at all in capitalist society. So capitalism relies on the sublime as the source of value, but then it obfuscates this role that sublimity plays in the creation of value by giving credit to the utility of the commodity rather than its sublimity or rather than its uselessness. It's, but I think it's the sublimity of the excess that's the source of the, com the commodity's value. So through the, the sublimity that it acquires, the commodity takes on a value beyond its utility. And this value beyond utility, you could call it, say, the excess of the commodity, functions as the source of profit for the capitalist. What's merely useful and only serves to reproduce the social order or reproduce the corporation is not a value within capitalist society. So the production of values that transcend use is actually what keeps capitalism going. Capitalism doesn't, it, of course, it does provide useful things to people, like the things that we're using now to communicate with each other. It provides even more essential things like edible food, toilet paper, apartments. Those are just the first three things that came to my mind. Uh, these objects are evidently useful. But capitalism's survival depends on the way that it replaces the utility object with the inutility of the commodity. It turns useful objects into partial, at least partially useless commodities. So let me just give the example of toilet paper. It turns simple, turns simple toilet paper into pattern and scented toilet paper, right? Completely useless, unnecessary, jacks up the price a little bit. It turns fresh apples into sweetened applesauce less good for you, but having more value in them. This process adds no utility at all, but actually adds inutility. And I think that's, it's even more, I'm picking the most useless examples. You can, the, 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 the more you, there are much more useless examples, I think, at, at hand. So capitalism propagates itself through this useless excess. And at first blush, I know this seems like a crazy statement because the capitalist universe produces all kinds of useful stuff. It keeps most people fed, keeps most people clothed, keeps most people housed. Even though it has obvious excesses, these excesses seem subsequent to the utility it provides. For instance, it might appear that first the capitalist system provides general housing before subsequently allotting mansions to the wealthy. But I don't think capitalism works this way at all. I think it actually it's the uselessness of the commodity that provides the key to its value. So first, something useless is produced, and then the use is added on to that afterward. And this is because the uselessness is excessive, and it's only the excessive that has value within capitalism.
capitalism. Only what's excessive provides a profit. Everything else just, what's useful just keeps things going as they are. So the capitalist would rather sell one useless commodity than 10 useful items because the demand for the useless is completely elastic, unlike the demand for the useful. Once you have enough of the useful, you have enough. There's never enough of the useless, right? I think that's the really the key idea. So one mansion is worth more than a hundred one bedroom apartments from the capitalist perspective because it can't contains within it more useless excess. The useless, I think, has priority within capitalist society because we enjoy what has no utility. And I think this is always true, that enjoyment is tied to the lack of utility. If one thinks about buying commodities, this discrepancy in enjoyment becomes almost self-evident. So no, I'm obsessed with this toilet paper example, I apologize. No one enjoys purchasing toilet paper, paper towels, but purchasing a new, a new necklace, new set of golf clubs, that's an act replete with enjoyment. One even enjoys trying on the necklace, having the golf clubs fitted to one's own size, trying them out. The more useless the commodity, the more enjoyment attached to it. Utility, I think, serves as an alibi within the capitalist system, but the system isn't here, it doesn't exist in order to respond to our needs. So commodities have the, lar the, commodities that have the largest markup, and I think this is really kind of shows what's at stake. The commodities that have the largest markup are the ones that sell are, are, that sell are the are the for those that sell them sorry are the most useless the ones with no practical benefit so jewelry cups of coffee they bring extraordinary profits soda brings extraordinary profit as do designer clothes tickets for sporting events in contrast this is to me very interesting groceries furniture retirement communities these things all operate with very small margins they don't provide a lot of added value for the people selling them. So they provide useful commodities, which there's why, which I think is why there's much less value in their sales. Technology, I want to contend, works hand in hand with capitalism because it provides useless commodities in the guise of usefulness. All sorts of technological developments have a clear utility. Zoom, washing machines, refrigerators, computers, iPhones, in each case, however, it's the inutility of the technological device that is the source of the value. The utility is, is almost like the bonus that accompanies the uselessness that we purchase when we buy them. So there's value in the washing machine, uh, for instance, in all these excessive functions that one never uses, not in the simple one that one actually uses. Similarly, I think the basic necessity of communication that one makes on an iPhone is not really the source of the value for us. Instead, the value consists in all the useless apps that we add to it and that the device enables us to access. So the key to challenging the dominance of the capitalist system, I think, lies in recognizing how it depends on the introduction of inutility into the commodities that produces, which is one thing that the defenders of capitalism absolutely cannot avow, and it's a really striking their inability to avow this. So in order to be a capitalist subject, one, I think, has to be blind to the role that inutility plays in the creation of value. All defenders of capitalism, I, I, I've read a lot, they, I don't think there's an exception. Uh, they insist on the value of the use, the, sorry, the use value that the system provides. Capitalism provides uses, useful things. One must believe that capitalism generates use values for us to be a, a capitalist subject. You have to believe that it gives us what we need. And the satisfaction of needs provides the justification for anything bad that accompanies the system, so, like inequality. For instance, David Ricardo uh, in Principles of, of Economy and Taxation, or Political Economy and Taxation, sorry. Uh, he begins this, his treatise on cap, this is the name of the treatise, uh, with a proclamation about the use value of every single commodity. This is what he says. He says, if a commodity were in no way useful, in other words, if it could in no way contribute to our gratification, it would be destitute of exchangeable value, however scarce it might be, or whatever quantity of labor might be necessary to pr pr uh, procure it. So Ricardo believes that labor generates value. I think he's right about that. Uh, but it only generates value if it produces useful objects. Exchange value for him depends upon use value. 
And this is what Ricardo and all other champions of capitalism believe, basically. What they miss, I think, is that the turn away from useful things is actually the sine qua non of capitalism. And no one has really noticed this because theorists of capitalism, inclusive of Marx himself, remain so devoted to the idea of utility. And I think that that's because they're not thinking in terms of the way that we enjoy what is excessive and what is not useful. So it seems too far-fetched to imagine, I think, that an entire social structure could be oriented around what's not useful for anyone. But I think that's the situation we're, we're in today. So the defenders of capitalism have helped to obscure this issue through this singular emphasis on utility. It's easy to point out, I think, the seemingly infinite number of useless commodities on the market. Uh, from rock concerts to diamond rings I mentioned, to bottled water, it's a great one, to cigarettes. I think uselessness is ubiquitous in the capitalist universe, but capitalism's reliance on inutility is not limited to those commodities that advertise their uselessness. The more useless a commodity is, the more value it generates. It's interesting because even the, the, the hammer, which seems utterly useful as an object, it ha in order to be valuable, it has to have different useless things added to it, like a nice handle or a nice, you know, nice little garnishes that are added to it, which make it cost more and which give it a value. So, but let's focus on the main useless object. So gold, silver, diamonds, right? So they're, these are, the objects have great value for us and they are completely, their value is completely divorced from whatever use we might make of them. We value inutility because we enjoy what we can't use. And the ways in which we enjoy gold, silver, and diamonds, I think, nicely reflect their inutility. We make jewelry out of them that serves no use whatsoever except to be looked at. We display them for guests to ogle. We might even hide them in well-guarded safes where they can't be used at all. The point is that the last thing we wanna do is use any of these commodities. We even enjoy just the act of touching them because they radiate so much uselessness so much value, so much sublimity. And I think money functions the same way, even though I think it, you could make the argument, obviously, that money is useful because you can spend it on useful things. But I think that the, the fact of the facticity of money, we're drawn to it precisely because it's useless and we like touching it. And Or if we're like Trina in the novel McTeague by Frank Norris, we like laying in a bed uh, filled with it. Okay, so the commodity has value to me insofar, I think, insofar as it transcends its usefulness. So when one buys a commodity, this transcendence is precisely what one pays for. It's what interests the consumer every bit, I think, as the capitalist producer. The uselessness is included in the price, but it's not what gives the commodity its value. Instead, the usefulness is akin to the necessary labor time that goes into the fabrication of the commodity. Okay, there has to be a necessary labor time, but it's the surplus labor time that creates the value in the way that Marx thinks, and I think he's right about that. But the surplus labor time, what it's doing, it's creating a useless excess that then is the source of value. So we need the useful basis, but only as a basis to be surpassed in the creation of value. So the inutility, the uselessness, is the point at which a sublimity enters into the commodity and gives the commodity its value. Without this sublime part of the commodity, there's no such thing as a capitalist society like the society we live in. The sublime is useless. The process of capitalist production and distribution lifts the commodity out of utility and gives it a value above and beyond what's just ready to hand in the object. And this is how I think the sublime urge emerges in capitalism. Even the most handy commodity has to have this dimension of uselessness in order to have a value as a commodity. I even think of like the little stickers they put on fruit as this little, I'm gonna add a little bit of uselessness to the, to the pure, seemingly pure object, purely useful object. Often the inutility of the commodity doesn't just transcend its use, but gets in the way of it. So to me, the greatest example of this, and I'm sure everyone's had difficulty with this, not just me, the package that envelopes, envelops, envelops, uh, the most technological devices makes them incredibly difficult to access. This packaging, packaging is not only not useful, it actually has a negative use because it's a barrier 
to using the object. You have to get scissors or a knife. You probably cut yourself. But the, the companies produce this excessive packaging. The alibi is, okay, it stops it from getting stolen. But when it's being shipped to you, it's not going to be stolen anyway. But I think it's produced an alibi for giving the, the object a sublime value by making it even more, by adding this dimension of uselessness to it. So inutility represents a point at which the capitalist gains value and the consumer, on our part, we experience value. The useless is the surplus that the worker produces for the capitalist in excess of that which is necessary to sustain capitalist production. So the point is to produce increasingly more and more and more of what's not useful. This is simultaneously what the consumer enjoys from the purchase and what the producer profits from. So capitalism creates a universe of wasteful things that we don't need, rather than functioning as a defect that would potentially undermine the investment in capitalism. I believe this is its major selling point. The introduction of what can't be used into what can actually characterizes capitalist production. Capitalism is the production of things that we don't need in the guise of things that we do. Utility gives, sub, gives people a reason to invest themselves in a commodity, but inutility is what causes them to do so. And this alibi of utility allows one to enjoy the uselessness of the commodity while believing oneself to be doing what, simply doing what's necessary. When enjoying a commodity, I don't know the actual source of my enjoyment. The excess of one's enjoyment disappears beneath the sheen of the commodity's apparent usefulness. I enjoy what in the commodity I cannot use. And I think that's the key to understanding how capitalism works, especially today. Thanks. Okay, thank you. My name is Per Torn, and I'm a Swedish writer. Uh, and I will read this poem, We're like a boat with water up to the gunwales, and there are waves breaking over the sides the whole time. And this poem I wrote in Swedish, um, something like 15 years ago, and... Uh, it got translated into English in 2008. And this poem, I constructed it through reading a Swedish web forum for a, an organization called the Ledarna, the Leaders, which is an organization for executive managers in Sweden. And when reading this forum, these discussions, I found lots of complaints about uh, employees. It was a recurring theme within this uh, uh, discussion and what to do with these uh, um, persons that didn't behave rational in the workplace basically or rational according to the executive managers. And this whole forum was uh, totally open when I started uh, working with this poem and I was cutting out lots of papers, uh, lots of uh, lines. It, uh, the whole master document was probably something like 30 pages or something like that. And then I was going through the whole master document line by line and cutting out everything that was not interesting in some way. And I was made up one line on my own, actually. But uh, I, don't, I won't tell you which one is made up, which one is true poetic value. The rest is documentary collage poem, basically. And it got translated into English by a translator called Sarah Death, a woman from London, and it was, got published within the Eurozine network. And uh, those guys paid for the translation. Uh, and the poem goes like this. 
I have an employee who is often ill and never more than one to three days and sometimes up to a week. She's ill about once a week. Several people in my company have said that they find the morning meetings boring because certain colleagues are always complaining about washing up cleaning and so on, though these aren't major problems. I'm being bombarded with circulars about the new law requiring every workplace to have a fire prevention officer. For several years, one of my colleagues has been difficult in various ways. I have tackled him about it on several occasions and he has received a written warning. After that, he calmed down, but contempt for any form of authority is still latent in him. One of my employees virtually always arrives late and often leaves early as well. Over a period of 17 working days, there have been 15 transgressions on his part in the form of late arrivals, premature departures, a whole day's absence without notifying me or being contactable by phone, and feigning illness at work. I'm beginning to suspect he is a drug addict. I have received an anonymous letter that says, quote, we don't want you here, unquote, and tells me to, quote, take your fat ass and make yourself scarce, unquote. What can I do? Hash it up or raise it with the staff, 46 of them, or report it to the police or go to the local paper. Anyone had experience of this sort of thing? In my team at work, there is a man, age 43, who consistently gets to work an hour and a half to two hours late. During the day, he disappears for an hour or two without any explanation. I have thought and thought about it and finally decided that he simply doesn't understand or doesn't want to understand or lives in a world where timekeeping at work doesn't matter. He's driving me mad, and it's reached a point where I find it hard to, to control my feelings. My bosses take it for granted that I am the person who's at the helm and also pretty supportive to the others. I want to give them some responsibility and a chance to prove they can handle it. I can't be in charge of every tiny detail, leaving them no scope for development. We have discussed this on a number of occasions, which has unfortunately only resulted in some of them thinking I'm nuts, basically. I have tried hard by means of various tricks to get them to see the advantages, but they immediately turn things around to make it a pay issue. Quote, if you expect us to do this now as well, then we want a pay rise, exclamation mark, unquote. Will I have to change my job to avoid drowning in these leadership demands that I can't rise to and have no interest in rising to? The business is in severe financial difficulties. Until now, staff members have been kept sweet by means of little supplements to their pay packet or personal favors at the cost of the overall business finances. Now that I have started rationalizing all this and stopped the supplementary pay, extra half days off, etc., a lot of the staff are disgruntled and directing their anger at me. I work under a lot of pressure and haven't got time to talk to them all individually, so I am just trying to be open and straight, but it isn't working. What do you do when you feel your job just soaks up all your energy and never gives you any back? What do you do when you feel criticized from below but never get any support from above? What do you do then? Somebody has graffitied www.arbetarmakt.com, which is Swedish for workers' power, and also the name of a Swedish Trotskyist organization during the 90s. 
arbetamakt.com, just outside our premises. I wonder if this is meant as a threat or something like that. One of my members of staff has had 13 periods of absence this year, some of them over two weeks long, some occasional days. My question is simply this, what does it require for me to be able to sack this member of staff? I have spoken to him personally more than once. I have issued written warnings, but they seem to have no effect on him whatsoever. I have looked him in the eyes. What measures can I sensibly take to get rid of the problem within the law? A former member of staff has given my name as a referee. This person is very ambitious and capable, but was signed off on long-term sick leave for stress. Now this person has the prospect of a new job and the new employer has contacted me to find out what the person is like. So my dilemma is, should I refer to the sick leave or just answer the questions in my capacity as a referee? Is it dishonest only to mention it if asked directly or should I reveal what I know? The other day I was told that the member of my staff who answers the phone here, quote, always sounds grumpy, unquote, quote, that she sounds as a lemon, unquote. I have no reason to doubt what the informant told me. How should I as a boss handle this? How can a person, quote, stop sounding grumpy, unquote, I instructed a colleague to attend the information sessions we hold for our clients so she would learn more about what the business really entails. Despite repeated instructions, she only ever attended the sessions for a few minutes before going off to do something else. Another of her tasks is to make sure the computer is working for the information sessions. When asked 20 minutes before the meeting whether the computer was working, she said no. Although she knew the computer wasn't working, she didn't inform me or anyone else, nor did she take any measures herself to have the fault rectified. Despite clear instructions that it is her responsibility to make sure that it works. Despite repeated instructions to get things ready for the information sessions several hours in advance, she does it at the very last minute. I don't want to give up, so I am trying to find out if there is any kind of cultural filter or something that I can circumvent by changing my approach. Three months have gone by without any progress, and given her current performance, we can't keep her on. I have to take a lot of, quote, shit, unquote, and it gives me stomach pains. I can usually maintain some distance, but sometimes it's not possible. Anybody got any tips on how to tackle this? On December 22nd, an anonymous email was sent to my husband at work, telling him about some alleged behavior of mine in the pub. I got the IT team in our security department to look into it, and they found out that the email was sent from one of the computer terminals at my firm. My husband's company also confirms that the email originated from one of the terminals at my firm. My whole department is in shock and the atmosphere is awful. I have now been called in for a confidential talk in which I am supposed to suggest what should be done next so we can put all this behind us. Is that really my job? I should mention in this context that this autumn I have repeatedly been subjected to verbal abuse at meetings. We have had to sort out problems specifically in my department. I have had my work shoes kicked under the locker in the changing room. 
when I told my line manager about it, she just waved the problems aside. The problems in our department all have to do with me, according to some of my colleagues. Am I to be made a scapegoat because of bad leadership from the top? And am I supposed to blame myself for being harassed and for my husband receiving emails like that? The email has been reported to the police. Should I leave my job, which I like, and for which I am valued by some of the more senior managers in the organization? I think the aim of the harassment is to make me leave. Should I ask for a transfer? Output is on its knees. I try to stay afloat, but I haven't time even for my basic duties. We are like a boat with water up to the gunwales, and there are waves breaking over the sides the whole time. What's more, as a result of not making optimal use of resources, I am not properly able to carry out my special assignments, which I am supposed to do once my ordinary work is complete. At the psychosocial level, it's a disaster. Personally, for example, I now keep my contacts with other people in the staff room to an absolute minimum. There are those who believe in me and take my side, but being in the company of the rest is something I do as little as possible. My line manager doesn't even believe the email was sent. She doesn't believe the other attacks took place. At various meetings at which I have been abusively referred to as, quote, a right devil, unquote, quote, pig, unquote, and, quote, moron, unquote, and at which the opinion has been expressed that I'm not doing my job. She has raised no objections. Despite the fact that at all these years, my performance and results have been excellent. If I leave now, the other side will have won. Now it seems another trade union is going to apply pressure to get me moved or make me hand in my notice. Well done, me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. The shredded hologram rose. She closes the door behind her. The lights are off, but the panel next to the door dimly lights up her little cube, dipping it in a relaxing blue hue that shows the outlines of her bed and some of her other collected belongings. She puts the pamphlets that she has left from her day out of surveying on the window sill. It's 7 p.m. now and she's so exhausted. Even after half a year of conversation practice, of training, uh, she is just tired after a few interactions. Everything is just so tiring. Her neighbor seems to be awake. Through the humming blanket of sound cancellation, she can still hear him scuffing around in his cube. <sighs> this is the scuromorphic sounds of wood. And it sounds like he's not about to sleep either. It will take probably some time for him to quiet down. Oh well. Maybe he was working. Maybe he was doing the surveying. But then in that case, it must have been just doing some credits with the keeper, 
keepers of meaningfulness. Everything is just a joke. She glances to the left. In the darkness, on the desk by her bed, she sees the fragments that had made up her beloved vintage hologram rose. Earlier that day, before she had left the cube and went out surveying, it had dropped from the ledge where it had been standing very safely since the day she had moved in. This is just a terrible start of an already challenging day in front of her. The 3D holographic object had been in her family's possession for cycles. She had, had always been told it was a one-of-a-kind static function object. Maybe it's because of the way today evolved, but now as it's laying there, so in front of her, broken, it actually looks like the shredded parts reveal something to her. Maybe it is really true what they say. Composite objects can reveal unknown unknowns, or at least things that one don't normally sees. She takes a closer look at one of its parts. Every surface still seems to show the whole image of the rose. But the shredded sides of this object, its cuts, seem to have formed new delta axes that reveal the previously opaque layers of the rose. They expose its render elements, the passes, the discorrelated instances, and the metadata that are needed to properly render a variety of possible resolutions of this hologram rose. It seems like these shreds of the rose now have become their own portals to a moment of a past she really was never part of. The shreds now show artifacts from times when artistic entrepreneurs claimed their work through blockchain hashes. Just after the great future had been initiated by the epoch of decentralization. I think this is when the recurrent neural networks, or the RNNS, and machine learning intelligence took over. First, the realms, they took over the realms of economy, then they took the realms of art, politics, law, and then finally they took over knowledge itself, which was kind of setting the brink of our great new future. She studies the leaves of the rose. These fragments seem to have acquired, have been acquired via an ERC721 protocol, which is a, a proof of provenance from before the breach of open sea. Then another shred captures her attention. Looking at it closely, it seems to reveal that the origins of the holo hologram rose must have been imported via a client that is called Meta. The threads of this hologram rose feel so iconic. Each fragment reveals a part of the rose from a different layer and also of a different mode of rendering. I mean, simple passes, render elements like an ID layer or a probing opacity pass. A bump map and a nested controlled axis are clearly visible amongst the threads. She also sees the DOI of the rose, which is registered at the Great Library of Google. And it's exciting to recognize a thread of the rose's smell, which is primed by Amazon, the great distributor. Wow. But then, at some point, Another thread captures our eye. Is this 
verified CRISPR clone data? That cannot be right. The breach of the open sea was a direct result of the inscription of CRISPR clone data inside the final NFT. She lays out all the pieces in front of her like a puzzle. Some of them seem to fit together. But when merged, the hologram rose that once lit up its holographic surfaces now renders into a weird amorphous resolution. On top of the shreds, a corrupt warning starts to flicker. This render may populate fungible strains. This render may populate fungible strains. This render may populate fungible strains. <sighs> Quickly, she takes the shards apart. This technology is from before the Great Wall of the Future. The Great Wall of the Future. It had all started in 1989 when the first recurring neural networks, so the RNNS, were used to generate music. Previously, artists already played around with the thought of musical creation using, for instance, Markov chains. Uh, and then since also the adoption of RNNS, uh, but slowly certain neural pathways got blocked and they blocked potentials for incidents. And this is how the future started to regurgitate itself. With the growing application of serendip inhibitors, slowly serendipity uh, became a future of the past. <sighs> what am I thinking about right now? It's like exactly what the serendipity survey today was all about. But in conversation, I could never find these words. While going from cube to cube to cube to cube to cube, I've been confronting the inhibitants with the question, what if the most dissatisfying technology of all is the one that is just working? Which was kind of a slogan back in the days for our movement. A movement that finds its roots directly after the wall of the great future was erected. When the, ro when the world had been mapped, and indexed in its entirety, when even the tiniest speckle of dust had been scanned, every book had been written, every image had been rendered, and all possible horizons had been set. Nothing was impossible anymore. When everything has been indexed and answered, freedom can be found everywhere. And it just makes sense. We found what we always were looking for. Everything now at the tips of our thoughts. Things just always work. Whatever I can think of ever, it always is just right there. It's still, to some of us, something feels wrong. It's like when we slipped past the event horizon of that functional information market, things just suddenly have come to a halt. Yes, we have arrived, the future has arrived, but it's a wall, and it feels like we're just continuously floating aimlessly in this ocean of everything walled by the future. Everything is now full of options, but where is the meaning, and where can I be surprised? No one is asking questions anymore. There are no more problems to tackle, no more protests, no more boycotts, no more cancelling, no more upgrades, no more signing in, no more transferring of data or backing up at once. Everything has arrived. We inhibit the new boring human. I desperately want to come back to an unstable world. So yeah, I guess with the serendipity survey, we tried to address this. We call for a hiccup of serendipity. We call for the failure of filters. We need to burn <laughs> the silos of indexical systems. We need to burn the Dewey Decimal systems and systems of knowledge and classifications. Let's set them all on fire. As the value of the unsought has disappeared, serendipity just seems to have vaporized.
We need to bring it back. Thanks a lot, Rosa, for your wonderful performance. And also thanks, Bear, for your poem and Todd McGowan for sharing his insights on technology with us. Um, before I send you off in the bar for a drink, I would like to share an insider's tip with you. Um, and that's the film Real Performance. And you can see it. It will be screened um, probably a few minutes after this hall is empty, um, in studio number three. That's on the first floor. It's a film by Grace Phillips and Laurie Robbins. Um, and it's a wonderful performance of a conversation. I can highly recommend it to you. Um, I also would like to thank our funders. And maybe, magically, a slide appears. These are the people that helped make this festival possible, our funders, our sponsors, and our partners. Uh, before we go off, I uh, would like to thank the curators, all the artists, and our funders. Please give them a warm applause.